Good evening, everyone. Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes. Okay, I hope all is well. Yes. Fantastic. It's a long time since I last uh, had a chat with you, but uh, I must welcome you to uh, 2023. Uh, I think I should say Happy New Year because we haven't met. Um, I was asked by uh, uh, my colleague, uh, that is Professor Vicent Bajire, to come and talk to you about systematic literature review. And uh, he also sent me the, uh, the learning outcomes and uh, an introduction to what should be covered under a systematic literature review. Uh, possibly before I really start, I'd like to introduce my colleague that I requested to uh, join us. Uh, he's a student like you and the staff in the Department of Economics uh, in the Faculty of Economics, Energy and Management Science, and that is uh, Mr. Joseph Elasso. Uh, Joseph, can you say hi to the uh, to your colleagues? Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, my colleagues, and uh, I'm glad to have an interaction uh, with all of you this evening. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Last Joseph. Um, I had talked to, uh, I forget her name, but I can see her uh, on the, she has named the, the gadget Rochelle. Uh, I had uh, a discussion with her. I told her that uh, uh, whereas uh, Professor Bajire had requested us to uh, cover systematic literature review, it's not something that we can cover in one lecture and uh, since for him he has a target of covering all the uh, topics on the course outline uh, asking him to give us around uh, uh, two lectures or three lectures uh, what would seem to be impossible uh, i don't think he will be able to give us that time so I had suggested to her that uh, we leave uh, uh, the time as it is for Professor Bajire to cover the other topics, but uh, we possibly look for one or two more uh, lecture time times uh, outside uh, his program. And she had kindly agreed to do that um, after contacting you. Um, and I told her that uh, when you are through, let me know. Uh, she had made some suggestions. Um, uh, I think you still have an opportunity to discuss with her and confirm uh, what she had suggested. Now, uh, the I should let you know the objective um, of our coming in, especially me and bringing in Joseph Elasso. I usually have a feeling that there are those things which are taught in class. And at the end of the day, students are examined and they are, well, they are given questions and they pass and even get 100 or 90%. But the 100% grades that they get out of the assessment is not really a reflection of what they are capable of doing. So, it's one thing to cram, reproduce, or even understand uh, the topic or subject and be able to answer questions accurately and you end up with uh, an A. And another thing for you to understand uh, the concepts and pick the knowledge in the subject and be able to use it to do something. 
And uh, my objective usually uh, in training, I want students to use the knowledge because I know very soon you will be writing your proposals. Uh, very soon you will be writing your dissertations and you'll be required to defend your dissertations. You'll be required to defend your proposals. Now, unless you pick this knowledge and uh, use it to construct your proposals and construct your dissertations, to me, I don't think learning would have taken place. So I decided to uh, bring in Joseph Elasso. Joseph Elasso is a, a PhD student uh, on a program that is exactly similar to the one that you are pursuing. That is PEG. That is a PhD in energy economics and governance. And Joseph happens to be one of the students who attended my lecture on systematic literature review. And he was able to quickly pick those ideas and uh, utilize them. Uh, so far we have, uh, I think co-published around the three papers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, using systematic literature review, right? And that's why I brought, I brought him in uh, to help me articulate some of the things, because I know when a student talks to the fellow students, uh, you seem to pick those concepts and ideas uh, better than uh, we, when, when we come and talk to you about this thing, because they all seem to be abstract at the end of the day. So that's why uh, he is in attendance. That's why he's attending this lecture too. So today, I'm not very sure whether I'll be able to cover the introduction, uh, but assuming that I'm able to cover the introduction, then I will give an opportunity to Joseph to come in and demonstrate a few things uh, practically. Uh, I remember at the time when we were doing this, especially in his group, we invited in another person uh, who is not here, that was Charles Olupot, who was also working on his PhD proposal. And um, uh, he was also able to participate and uh, he picked a number of ideas. Uh, unfortunately, today we did not invite him, but I think in our next lecture, uh, we shall invite him so that uh, Joseph um, uh, Olupot, Charles and myself uh, will be able to put together those ideas and uh, I hope at the end of the day, you'll be able to utilize uh, that knowledge. Now, I have always told my students, especially the ones I supervise, uh, I happen also to, uh, to supervise Joseph Elasso, uh, but I've always told my PhD students, the ones I supervise, that the first thing that you must produce is a systematic literature review. And this is a must for all my students. There are those who uh, certainly uh, think that uh, maybe uh, I'm more just uh, being hard and um, uh, maybe I don't want them to uh, finish their proposals very fast and, uh, and, 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 um, and submit them to GRC uh, for evaluation, right? Now, for those who have such ideas, I, and, and they move around in circles, maybe for a period of one month, or around six months, they soon or later realize that they must actually come back uh, to the drawing board and work on a systematic literature review. Because without it, I do not believe that you can even write a meaningful uh, proposal. Uh, because most of the questions that you'll be required to answer in terms of what is new uh, will, not, uh, will not be answered by you, right? There is always that question of what is new. And uh, it's quite important uh, that you answer that question. I know it will be 
you will be faced with the same question, right? Uh, so I, I know you will sit and say, you know, for us, we are doing a PhD in energy economics, you know, uh, this is more or less similar to economics and um, I mean, in all respects. And for us, the models we use in economics, uh, we always work around the same variables of age, sex, education, type of dwelling and so forth. And um, I can assure you with the type of people that we have in the business school and the background they have and the understanding of research, that research will not make sense to them. The question of what is in you must be answered, right? And you can only answer that question by undertaking a systematic literature review. Now, a systematic literature review is a totally different uh, from the normal reviews that we are very familiar with, or the type of uh, what you call traditional uh, literature reviews. Uh, since I see many uh, messages here, let me first read the messages. Uh, anyway, they are, I think you are greeting each other, right? Uh, so allow me to share uh, my screen, uh, which I'll be using, right? Uh, I want to use my slides here. Uh, to make my presentation, right? And uh, as you can see, uh, let me see, I don't know why it is not working. I hope you are seeing, right? Uh, you will forgive that black thing that appears below there. Uh, I think what should have appeared at the top there is what is appearing at the sides. Uh, so you just have to ignore it. Right, so we are looking at conducting systematic literature review, and I've already given you the objective, right? Now, our discussions will mainly center around eight areas, which I'm not very sure we'll be able to cover today. And uh, the first area, as you can see there, is the introduction and importance of a good literature review, right? And of course, as you can see there, we are looking at general aspects, right, of a good literature review, not necessarily talking about systematic literature review, right? I need to introduce you to literature review first before we move into systematic literature review. Now, the second aspect that we shall discuss is the purpose of a good literature review. Many of us do not actually know why we have to review literature. Many of us do not even appreciate that section of literature review. Even when we are writing literature review, we simply write notes. We simply present summaries. And uh, if uh, somebody, especially an examiner or examiners. If examiners were very strict and rigid, they would give you a zero and a literature review section, which is actually your chapter two of your dissertation. And after giving you a zero, then the fellow will go back to chapter one, where you have your objectives and hypothesis and also give you a zero around hypothesis because those hypotheses and research questions or propositions are supposed to be derived from a review of literature. Now, if that section is not done very well, you'll have a problem, right? And that's why you need to master that area very well. And that's why I thought that um, uh, having two hours uh, will, not be, will not be enough for us to really talk about this thing that we call a literature review. Then we shall move to uh, uh, level number three or point number three, where I will present to you a typology of reviews so that you appreciate that under literature review, you've got various types of reviews. And it's only after you have understood the types of reviews that you will be able to single out the type of review that you are having in your dissertation and reasons as to why you should have that. 
Now, from there, we shall go to number four, and you, I'll give you a comparison between systematic literature review and traditional literature review, right? I want you to see a distinction between the traditional literature review that you'll find in most PhD students at GRC using, right? And when you read what they have written down, you'll actually see very little content, if any, right? Uh, demonstrating newness in their work. So, but if you cut out some of the reviews that I'll be talking about here, you'll be at a higher level, right? And um, uh, you will be able to appreciate and also be appreciated by scholars and will even become very easy for you to publish papers, right? Other than simply celebrating knowledge. So systematic literature review and um, other forms of reviews like meta-analytic meta review and the rest of them will help you, right, to, uh, uh, to add knowledge to the existing body of knowledge. You'll be able to add something new, right? And knowledge grows incrementally. You may not have to add something that is substantial, right? But um, whatever you add will be appreciated by scholars. And you can only do that if you are able to undertake some of these reviews as opposed to systematic, uh, sorry, as opposed to traditional uh, literature review. Then I'll give you the aims of a systematic literature review, uh, the process of writing a systematic literature review, right? Of course, there are, uh, uh, that, that's an error, uh, but uh, generally in business, right? Uh, so you should know how to write systematic literature review in business, uh, whether you are doing energy economics or you are doing entrepreneurship or accounting, right? Um, then you should be able to use that. Then seven, we'll be looking at general settings, right? And then we go to the conclusion. Now I will involve um, uh, Joseph when I reach uh, step six, right? Uh, and even Charles, when we reach that stage of writing, right? And and generally looking at the various formats that we have, right? I'll give an introduction and then uh, they will be coming in there. Then we shall have a conclusion uh, thereafter, right? So as you can see, as I had earlier uh, intimated, right? I need to uh, uh, give you an introduction and then also uh, give you the importance of good literature review, right? Now, of course, when we talk about a literature review, right, we are really talking about surveys, right? And here you need to understand what I'm saying and uh, the way I'm using the word surveys. I do not actually mean you designing an instrument and going to the field and collecting data. No. Right. What I mean here is that um, we have numerous publications in form of books, in form of journal articles, what we call scholarly articles, right, and other sources of literature uh, available. So in this case, we simply say that you survey the books that are available, you survey the scholarly articles, right? And uh, any other source or sources relevant to a particular issue or an area of research or probably theory, right? So in your case, if you are working on a topic, right? Like my friend uh, Joseph, who is working on transitions, right? Energy transitions, right? So he has to look for books. He has to look for journal articles, scholarly journal articles, right? Not everything you find on the internet is scholarly, ladies and gentlemen. Not everything you find on the internet is scholarly. And that's why when we ask you to go to the internet, we want you to start with the scholarly journal articles. We want you to go to Google Scholar, start with the Google Scholar, right? Because Google Scholar will bring, right, all articles that have been 
published under a peer review mechanism. Right, and of course, not all of them are very good. You are going to drop a number of them. We shall see that when we come to what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria under systematic literature review. But at least you begin by uh, going to Google Scholar, uh, which will uh, give you uh, a number of uh, publications that are available, right? Uh, and you may have here a very huge record of around 2 million hits or even 6 million hits or 10 million hits. Uh, if an area is new, then you may have around a very few, possibly around 600,000 or around 100,000 um, uh, hits in that area. So you survey the books, you survey the scholarly articles and the other sources uh, which are relevant to a particular issue that you have interest in or an area of research or probably a theory that you want to uh, to utilize in your research, right? And uh, as you go through these books and the articles, right, it's important that at the end of the day, you must provide a description. You must provide a summary. You must provide a critical evaluation of those journal articles or scholarly journal articles or books, right, in relation to the research problem that you are investigating. So your literature will be relevant if it addresses your topic or your subject of investigation. So that's why it is very important uh, for you to begin with an area Right, and then go to the internet and start looking for journal articles, right? Don't start with the journal articles when you have no idea of what you want to study, right? But if you, if you want to gain, um, I mean, general knowledge about the discipline, then that's okay. You can start by going to the internet, but I don't even know how you are going to uh, select the words that you will, use, that you will be using in searching uh, journal articles, right? So, that is what we really uh, call literature review, right? And of course, you may have uh, been told uh, right from your undergraduate up to where you are now, uh, masters, right? And then PhD level, you are transiting to PhD, right? You may have been told that um, literature review, right? Uh, or reviews, generally speaking, literature reviews, are designed to provide an overview of sources that you have explored while researching a particular topic. So in other words, you must be able to provide that overview, right, of your sources. And you must demonstrate to your readers, you must demonstrate to your professors, you must demonstrate to FGSR, right, how your research fits within a larger field of study. And that's why you are really doing a literature review, right? Why are you doing a literature review? You want to demonstrate, right, to the uh, School of Graduate Studies, right, that your research fits within a larger field of study that you have selected, right? Like in the case of Joseph, I've told you that he's working on, uh, uh, on energy transitions, right? So when he starts talking a bit about the uh, traditional fuels, right? And he talks about the transitions and later on he talks about modern fuels, right? So he must be able to uh, pick journal articles, right? That talk about the transition, right? Uh, from traditional fuels to modern fuels. So I think you can see how important it is. And let me tell you, you will never be able to convince anybody that you have something to say or you've got something new unless you understand your field very well. It's like today if I asked each one of you to go to your nearest forest, right? and uh, uh, examine all the trees that exist in the forest, right? 
and uh, uh, be able to look far, right, beyond the trees that are in the forest and demonstrate to us how you can actually come up with a tree that is taller, right, than the tallest tree in the forest. I know very well that you will not be able to do that unless you stand on the tallest tree in the forest for you to know what there is in the forest. If you are simply below under the trees, you'll never be able even to describe, right, the nature and the canopy of the trees that you have in the forest because you have no idea. So what you have to do is to climb the tallest tree, sit on the tallest tree, right, and then be able to articulate what next. And this is exactly what we do in a literature review. You must stand, right, on the uh, tallest shoulder, right, of scholars in this case, who have created knowledge in that particular area, yeah. and then be able to demonstrate a need for further investigation after knowing what exists in that area. Later on, I'll be demonstrating to you how we do that, especially using uh, uh, three methods of um, uh, constructing literature, right? Using either the progressive, right? Or the, uh, what you call the uh, coherence or non-coherence uh, uh, literature review uh, uh, methodology. Right. So you can construct your literature using progressive coherence or using non coherence, uh, or probably using what you call the uh, synthesized uh, coherence uh, for that matter. So I'll be articulating and describing those things to you later on. Right. I think now uh, we can go to the importance of literature review. I've somehow highlighted, right, uh, the importance, but without going into uh, detail, right. Uh, so as I've already said, a literature review may actually consist of simply a summary of key sources, right. But um, in social sciences, right, uh, the, your literature review usually has uh, a pattern Right, what I call an organizational pattern. And when you come to systematic literature review, that pattern is visible. With a traditional literature review, I mean, you may teach people how to do it, but I can assure you, it will be very hard for people to pick, right? But um, uh, under systematic literature review, it is uh, quite evident. But I'm not saying that traditional doesn't have, it has uh, an organization uh, a pattern. So in other words, it will combine both uh, summaries or what you call a summary and a synthesis, right? And this summary and the synthesis will often uh, 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 be within uh, a specific conceptual uh, category, right? In other words, if you're looking at uh, energy transitions, like in the case of El Elasso, right? So you will be, I mean, his research, the pattern that he comes up with, that organizational pattern of his literature, right, will have a summary fine, but will have a synthesis, right, within the conceptual uh, domain or category of energy transitions. So we don't expect him to pick knowledge from all over the place, right, and they start telling us that uh, uh, this is what I am actually looking at. So he will be having that aspect. And of course, in this case, when we talk about a summary, right, we are talking about a recap uh, of the important information, right, uh, of the source, right, where you are picking it from. And you, 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 you'll be picking this from journals, right? Uh, and some of the journals, uh, like in his case, uh, in the area of energy economics, uh, some are probably uh, in other journals of innovation. And uh, so you, you'll find the literature really scattered all over the place, right? But he must be able to tell us 
where he is contributing knowledge. And this is very important. So if you are going to look for journal articles on the internet, be careful, right? When you are picking these journal articles, I'm not objecting the fact that uh, uh, some of the uh, researches that have been done are interdisciplinary. I am well, I'm aware of that, that some of the energy papers will be found, for example, in technology journals, while others will be found in the business journals. I'm aware of that. Right, but the, 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 big, the, the, the most important question that must be answered here is, if I'm going to add knowledge, if I'm going to create a new knowledge, where am I contributing knowledge? Am I contributing knowledge in accounting? Am I contributing knowledge in marketing? Am I contributing knowledge in economics? But even economics is very huge. Is it development economics, right? Uh, is it socioeconomics, right? Is it um, uh, energy economics? That kind of thing. So you must be able to, uh, to, to, to create a niche, right? In a particular area where you intend uh, to uh, contribute to knowledge. So when we talk about a summary, we are looking at a recap of the, uh, of the information Right, that relates to the source, right? And that's why we talk that's why we talk about important information of the source. But when we talk about a synthesis, we are really referring to a reorganization of knowledge. We are simply referring to um, reshuffling, right, information, reshuffling knowledge, right? Uh, uh, and you must reshuffle and reorganize knowledge in a way that will inform how you are planning to investigate a research problem. So do not simply uh, pick an idea here and you start concluding, right? And then you say, well, uh, there is um, uh, a debate, right, in literature about this particular concept of, the tra of transition, right? And uh, most of the studies that have been conducted are inconclusive, right? You cannot make that statement unless you've done a systematic literature review. Now, I know what some people do, especially in the traditional literature review, they simply land on a journal article that was published in 1997, which says that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are disputes and debates in this area. And um, uh, the the discussions or debates in this area are, inc are inconclusive and they cite, right? Now, of course, that is something they have picked in a journal published in 1997 or 2003, but we are in 2023. So you cannot actually convince me that a statement like that, which was published in a journal, in a paper, in 2017 or even 2020, right, will still be valid today in March 2023. So unless you do a systematic literature review and you get to understand the number of publications in that area and what has been done and what remains to be done, you will not be able to say anything meaningful. And that's why we are saying, yes, with the synthesis, we are talking about reorganization of knowledge we are talking about reshuffling, right, of information, and you reshuffle that information and reorganize it in the way that will inform, uh, of course, um, our scholars, but will even inform you, right, how you intend to uh, plan uh, to investigate uh, that research problem that you have uh, interest in, right. So that's why it is actually very important for us to know the value of literature review, right? And of course, what we need to know here before we go to the purpose of uh, literature review, right? We need to know some of the features, right? Uh, of literature review, right? Or what we call a good literature review. And I call them analytical features. Because when you read those journal articles, 
and you begin picking ideas in those journal articles, we don't expect you to celebrate knowledge. We do not want you to celebrate. We want you to be analytical, right? You are supposed to be critical in your approach, right? Um, and and uh, that critical analysis is very important. So we have, we've got analytical features, right, of a literature review, right? And these analytical uh, literature, sorry, analytical features may include things like, uh, for example, uh, giving a new interpretation of old material, right? You read a journal article published around 2019, right? That is old, right, material, or even 2020, that is old, 2021, that is old. So you, you'll be able, once you read, you'll be able to provide a new interpretation of the old material, or you'll be able to combine the old material with the new material, right? And then give your interpretation. And that's why in a systematic literature review, you must make a decision and say, I'm going to download journal articles uh, published between, for example, 2015 uh, or probably between 2010 and 2023. Right. Of course, if you look at journal articles published between 2010 and 2023, right, those journal articles are many. You can even uh, pick around 600 journal articles, or probably you can pick 300 journal articles, right? I don't know how many you'll pick, depending on the discipline or the topic that you are investigating. Now, if you pick, uh, for example, 600 journal articles, we expect you to read right all these journal articles and the moment you read all the journal articles then you must come up with a synthesis of these journal articles and it's actually very important that you do that so in other words you'll be able to uh, get um, a new interpretation of the old material or probably combine the old material with the new material uh, to give directions for future research and possibly that's what we do uh, most of the time now, of course, the other aspect which is uh, very important uh, in this area is the ability to trace the intellectual uh, progression of the field, right? Uh, this is very important uh, because if you are studying an important area and you have located your topic, right, uh, in a particular uh, discipline, right, uh, or probably uh, in a subtopic within a, a within a discipline, right? Uh, as you review the journal articles, you must tell us how far knowledge has developed in that particular area. And if you recall, uh, a few minutes ago, I did tell you that um, uh, we, you can use progressive coherence, right? Or you can use what you call uh, uh, synthesized or coherence, or what we call um, uh, uh, non-coherence. Now, let me explain what those three uh, mean if you're going to use progressive coherence. If you're going to, pro to use progressive coherence, it simply means that uh, in that area of yours, there is literal, uh, 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 there, there, there are very few studies that have been conducted, right? And in fact, when you go to the internet, and you use Google Scholar, you may end up picking around um, uh, 100 journal articles, right? And when you look at the years in which those journal articles were published, you may discover that they were all published between, for example, 2015, right? 2015 to let's say 2023, right? Or even 2010, right, up to uh, possibly around 2015, and then you discover that there's a break, right, in the publications, and then possibly uh, a few other publications come up between 2017 and 2022, right? So, in other words, when you pick those journal articles, right, and you summarize knowledge very well, you will be able to, you'll be able to tell Right, how far knowledge has developed in that area, 
So you will, for example, discover that in the first uh, 10 years, between 2010 to let's say 2020, right, most of the scholars were actually conceptualizing uh, energy transitions. So, and that is a conclusion you get after reviewing all the journal articles, most of the journal articles between 2010 and 2020. Now, you may discover that uh, between 2010, sorry, 2020 and 2023, the debate has shifted. It's no longer the transitional debate, no. We know enough about transition, fine, but um, our next level in the growing understanding of this concept of transition, right, scholars are dealing with, let's say, the concept of green energy, right, within the transitions, because they, they have more or less done, right, what they thought should have been done in that area, but what is bothering them now is the concept of green energy, right, within the transitions. So what it means here is that you are able to trace the intellectual progression, right, of energy transitions in that field. In other words, you are able to know the major debates, right, and even the disputes that exist. Right. Luckily enough, when you are using progressive coherence, you are concerned with the debates and how the debates are growing, are developing. Right. And of course, depending on the transition and depending on the situation that leads to, to transitions, then you are able to evaluate the sources and advise the reader on the most pertinent or relevant research that should be conducted. And this usually appears in the conclusion section of a literature review. And of course, in that section, you are also able to identify where gaps exist, right? And how a problem has been researched to date. And it's quite important uh, for us to do this. And we shall demonstrate to you how you can do it. It's very easy. You know, as I talk about these things now, some of you are already scared. And you are saying, how shall we manage this? You will manage, right? Uh, we've done it. And uh, I can assure you, Joseph will be telling you that this is very easy. We've done it before, right? And uh, that was the objective in their class. And we did it very well. So uh, one of the things you should bear in mind as I take you through this systematic literature review, I'm not concentrating, I'm not concentrating on the traditional reviews of literature. I am concentrating on systematic literature review, right? And do not misunderstand what I'm doing. So I think now uh, we can uh, move to the purpose uh, of literature review, right? And this is very important, right? And, and I think somehow I've been talking about these issues uh, during my uh, discussions, right? During my presentations. And I do not really have to uh, waste a lot of time uh, on this slide. Maybe let me try to check out. I'm not very sure whether you are still hearing me or I have lost you. Uh, can somebody uh, unmute and talk to me? Uh, just give feedback as to whether you are with me or you are even hearing what I'm saying. I know I have some interruptions here, uh, but you have to bear with me. Are you hearing? Are you, hear, you can hear. Great. Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Fantastic. Right. So maybe after this uh, slide here, I'll give you an opportunity to ask before we go to the typology of literature reviews. Now, uh, this is the purpose of a good literature review, right? A is to provide foundation of knowledge on the topic that you are investigating, right? This is very important. It's like when you are building a house, you will never build right a very you never build a very strong house right if you don't have a very good foundation right and that's why even the bible talks about um, uh, a house that was built on sand and another one that was built on a rock right so even your phd 
can be built on sand, right? If you don't do a good literature review, your PhD is uh, just on sand. And I can assure you, any slight appearance of wind will bring that house down. So even when these people are subjecting you to a viva, uh, the proposal defense, and also uh, presenting your pilot results, right, and other sections, including a public defense, uh, they're actually testing the house that you have built, the house you've been building for the last four years. Can it really withstand the wind, right? So if you fail, you will have failed yourself. Do not come up and say that the professors don't like me, right? The professors are very malicious, right? And that's why they failed me. I cannot continue, right? That is not correct, right? There is no good farmer, for example, uh, who will first roast his seeds and then thereafter go to the garden and start planting those roasted seeds. He knows very well that he will get nothing out of the roasted seeds. They will actually rot. And there's no good parent, right, that will destroy his children or child after giving birth to them, right? So we all love you as PhD students, and we are there for you to provide direction, to provide guidance so that you are able to complete your PhD within the stipulated time. And for me, I believe that a PhD can be completed in two years. It can be completed in two and a half years. If you observe the rules and if you have a supervisor, right, that uh, will monitor your progress and will also follow timelines, you can actually complete your PhD, right? But of course it takes the effort of the supervisor and the effort of the student. If a supervisor, uh, pushes you, and for you, you want to do things at your own pace, right? Of course, you'll get annoyed, and you'll not go very far in most cases. So all the supervisors we have, at least the one I know, the ones I've interacted with, are interested in your completion, provided you, go, you do a good job. And for me, I'm telling you, the starting point is a good literature review and I've always emphasized the importance of doing a systematic literature review, right? And I want you to try it and see how far you'll go. I can assure you, you'll go very far and you'll achieve results at the end of the day. So a good literature review will provide a foundation of knowledge on the topic that you are investigating. It will also identify areas of prior scholarship to prevent duplication and give credit to other researchers. So it will no longer be an aspect of getting somebody's journal article and you start duplicating and you start Xeroxing and you start um, uh, behaving like a kasuku, right? Uh, where you, 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 you sing, right? What others have said, have been saying, and you also demonstrate that you understand the discipline, right? Of course you will, appear, right, to those who do not understand the area very well, you appear to them as somebody who is very scholarly, somebody who is very knowledgeable. To those who have read, read that particular area will simply look at you as somebody who does not understand the discipline and what you are saying. And it's not a question of he who shouts most, right? Um, but um, it is really uh, to those who are able to uh, get uh, uh, these journal articles, read and critique and come up with a synthesis. So in other words, you are able to identify areas of prior uh, studies, right? And um, you'll be able to prevent duplication. So you don't simply pick variables. The way I've seen most of my, uh, my, 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 my students, especially in energy economics, right? When you tell them that, um, uh, you need to give us a theory in the background. They say, but for us in economics, this is not very important, right? When you tell them to demonstrate, right, how their work is grounded in a theory, they say, but this is not economics. Economics, we don't do it that way, right? And uh, they'll say, we only have a theory that informs the methodology, right? That's where we only talk about a theory, right? And then you'll find these people talking about the same variable always, same variables, age, sex, 
income, education. So they can't go beyond those variables. You ask them, what is new in your work? They will say, yes, they have used a different methodology, right? Last time, uh, the other scholar used this kind of thing. For me, I'm using uh, some, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm using a social accounting matrix, right? And therefore, uh, uh, that, that, I mean, that creates a newness in my work, right? But we're saying no, right? If we know those variables, age, sex, right? Uh, education, those are demographics. Can't we go beyond those variables? And we can't go beyond those variables by undertaking a systematic literature review, right? So if you do your literature very well, that will take us to bullet number three. You'll be able to identify inconsistencies. In other words, disputes, right? You'll find the contradictions. Not all scholars agree, right, about certain things, right? And that's why when you are reading these journal articles, do not be one-sided, right? That I know, uh, I'm sure for those who are on the, uh, on the uh, MOOBS WhatsApp group, you saw what I posted yesterday. Right, somebody talking about somebody who went through a school of economics uh, in the in the in the UK and the US and went through the top schools, right? And then later on he had to shift and go to the business school, right? So he was describing how economists do things and how they think, right? And for him, he was saying, I, I, I was not in touch with the reality, right? until I had to go to the, a business school. And the business school is always uh, located uh, opposite to the uh, School of Economics, right? Uh, and I said, and, and he said, this is where the real thing takes place. You are in touch with the reality, right? And, and, and I'm sure you also had a debate that is taking place uh, in America now, right? Uh, about economic policies, right? And as they were asking for money, right, uh, 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 to, to do certain things, right? And these fellows are saying, no, you want money to do A, B, C, and D. And when we do a systematic literature review, in fact, the fellow was basing on systematic literature review. We see that in those years, right, when these policies were actually adopted by the American economy, this is what happened, unemployment rose. And the fellow was saying right now, unemployment is about 3.7. But if you do what you are proposing to do, unemployment will rise to around 6.7. And then if you uh, continue doing this kind of thing, it will go to 10.7. And, and the gentleman says that uh, you'll be putting the American economy into some kind of crisis, right? Unemployment rate going up to 10.7 is probably very high, right? So I think you can see uh, the debates, right? But all this is based on literature review, as you can see. So you'll be able to identify inconsistencies, right? Where you have those disputes, debates, you'll be able to identify gaps in literature, uh, conflicts in previous studies, right? Including those open questions that uh, were not really addressed, right? So they were left uh, from other studies that were conducted. And that's why we need to do a, a systematic literature review uh, for that matter. And we also, we, we, once we do it very well, we shall also be able to identify the need for additional literature, uh, as well additional research. And that's where you actually fit in, right? So when we ask you, what is your contribution to knowledge? That is actually bullet number four. So once you understand those gaps, right, in research, the conflicts, the open questions, then you'll be able to identify the need for additional research, and that is your research, right? You position it uh, within the available literature, right? And then later on, uh, your literature review will be able to help you identify the relationships of works in the context of, uh, of his contribution to the topic and also to other works. And then, of course, um, uh, you place your research within a particular research program, as you can see, uh, without really uh, going into uh, details, right? So that is uh, very important. And uh, I don't know whether I should really uh, spend too much time on this. But I think what I'll do, uh, let me give you an opportunity to ask a question. 
and then we go to a typology uh, of reviews, right? Uh, so let me minimize this a bit if I can so that I am able to see the hands that are up, right? Right, anybody with the, a question? Anybody with a comment? Salma, Emmanuel? Salma, Emmanuel? Yes, Prof. Uh, please go ahead. Prof, I don't have any question. Oh, you might be having a comment. <laughs> Are we together? Yes. Yes, Prof. I I have a question. Please go ahead. This is Florence. Yes, Prof. This is Florence. Um, yes, please. If what if I'm studying an area and I totally fail to get literature directly uh speak okay talking about that area. For example, if I'm looking at energy transition communication and I have studies on energy conservation communication, energy efficiency communication, but I fail to get studies except those who are recommending a study in energy transition communication. Now, after looking at the, the progressive literature review, now I, I I, I don't have a progressive paper to a prog progressive literature to to put across. How do you go about such a challenge in literature review? Thank you very much. I'll first ask my assistant to respond to that question. Uh, Joseph, can you respond to that question? Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, uh, uh, my sister uh, Florence is talking about energy transition communication, and uh, you, you seem to indicate uh, there, there there appears to be no literature in that regard, and probably uh, you're trying to refer to published journal articles. Uh, as of now, I may not give you a conclusive response, but I would also want to encourage you to. Think about gray literature. Uh, think about gray literature uh, in possibly in that area. Uh, you may be able to, to get some literature there, but gray literature, that's one. Then number two, um, we are talking about energy, we are talking about transition, and then we are talking about communication. The challenge I'm seeing here, you have two active words there. There is transition itself, then there is communication. And you want to test these two in the field of energy. So at some point when we begin to do uh, the practical part of uh, reviewing literature systematically, you will notice that we have to design some words, uh, what we call the Boolean words, or the search kit words or phrases. It is possible that you could not be able to get uh, information because you could have uh, set some Boolean words that may capture for you the information that you are looking for. But uh, as of now, Prof, I would like to probably say that uh, there are some other venues that uh, Florence could do, explore to try to see that you able to find some literature in that area, because I believe uh, there is uh, nothing that is very new as of now. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. There must be some work that has been done. The only issue is how do we access that work? Prof, maybe for now I could do, uh, stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Elasso. I'm just imagining that Salma wants to answer the question. Uh, Salma, you want to answer? Please go ahead and answer. No, Prof, I had a question. Uh, not uh, let's first answer a question 
<laughs> uh, let's first answer our question, <laughs> then later on we can uh, take on more questions. Uh, well, right. just, uh, since you don't have an answer, let me respond to, let me add to what uh, Joseph uh, has just given. Uh, Florence, it's rare these days that you'll find a study that has no literature. Rare, 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 unless you are breaking a new ground. Uh, and then it will be the Einsteins, the Isaac Newtons, right? So if you are breaking new ground, yes, you are talking about a concept that has never been studied before. Now, for me, when I listen to what you are saying, I, you, you, some of the words are actually a bit redundant. Uh, if you if you are talking about energy, maybe you can repeat. Did you say energy communication transition or energy transition communicate whatever? What did you say? Can you say it again? Florence, Florence, are you with us? Energy transition communication. Uh -huh. Energy transition. So really, if you hold energy transition, if you hold the word energy, right, uh, as a constant, you are talking about communication. Right. Yes. But the communication that will give you that transition from, let's say, traditional fuels to modern fuels, not so? Yeah. Is, 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 is that a proper understanding and interpretation of your topic? It is the exact interpretation of the yes. topic. So in other words, you're actually talking about communication and how many studies have been published about communication. You see, for every communication you... You, you come up with that you design right and execute it it, it has a, a purpose an intended purpose right and there must be an outcome right for example if you are in the area of marketing possibly you want to persuade the consumers to buy something right so, and that will be persuasive communication uh in some cases you might you might want to remind clients that you know this product will be available in the future, that kind of thing. But yours is meant to create the transition. You are telling people to shift from A to B, right? And for me, I, I don't think that is new at all. If you go to the field of communication, right, you'll find so many, and, and I'll tell you to, actually go to an area, sorry, a, a discipline that is very close, and that is public health. Public health is replete with the journal articles that talk about transitions, right? Uh, so the, the, most of the communications there are, are meant to do that kind of thing, plus a few other things, an intervention really. Um, so, and, and in this case, when you are constructing, I think as Joseph has already highlighted, you need to be very careful about the Boolean words that you're going to use, right? The such words, right? And if you are very careful and you, you use synonyms or some of those things that are close, because if you use the traditional words like transition and communication, you may not get anything. So you, you may have to, uh, to modify your such words, right? From time to time. But number two, I can see your study combining what we call, especially when you are constructing literature, combining what we call progressive coherence and synthesized coherence. So uh, progressive in the sense that you might be having new study, sorry, very few studies in that area, because this is a new area, right? Researchers have been talking about other things, so you have very few journal articles. Now, the second bit of it is that um, uh, you will be able to, uh, to pick journal articles from other related disciplines, right? So in other words, uh, you will pick some journal articles from uh, energy, others will be picked from strategic communication, others will be picked from marketing and that kind of thing. So in other words, you'll pick knowledge from public health, from marketing, 
Right, especially after knowing how far the discipline of uh, energy communication, transitional communication has advanced. You say, yes, this is what we know, right? However, uh, energy uh, transition communication, right? Maybe the conceptualization, right? Or probably uh, the prediction of this kind of thing has been given less attention, right? And therefore our next, right, logical step in the growing understanding of the energy uh, transition communication is to handle this kind of thing. So for you, you even have um, uh, uh, at least ground uh, to set a research gap because possibly very little has been done in that area. Right, so that's why it is still important for you to start with the uh, systematic literature review. Now for you to simply wake up today and say that, you know, nothing has been done in this area, right? It's for you to really pass wrong judgment right, without really even downloading journal articles, right? So try to do a systematic literature review and also check in the related disciplines like public health, like um, a strategic communication or even strategy and marketing. Uh, then uh, it's only after you've downloaded those things that you'll be able to uh, tell us how far and how much has been done in that particular area, right? However, I should also say, um, and um, uh, this is important uh, to you, if you download those journal articles, you need to, first of all, classify those journal articles, right? Um, those that you think are very close to your area, that is energy transition, right? And those that are probably in the area of marketing so that you are able to tell, right, uh, the distribution of uh, papers mm -hmm. in the various journals and disciplines and what this means uh, to the future development uh, or growth of knowledge in your area. Does that make sense, uh, Florence? Yes, Prof. It makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you so much. Now we can uh, go mm -hmm. to uh, Saruma, who wanted to ask a question. Saruma, you can ask. Salma? Yes, thank you. Please. Yes, please. Uh, uh, my question was on, you talked about coherence on systematic literature review, but you mentioned progressive coherence, then you also mentioned syn synthesized coherence. So the synthesized coherence is what I need more explanation about. Synthesized, I've just talked about it, uh, especially when you begin, uh, and, and that's exactly what uh, Florence uh, possibly will be doing, right? Uh, downloading journal articles from a number of disciplines. Uh, these are disparate, disparate fields of study, not necessarily in energy economics, right? Or probably energy transition. Uh, so that brings in an element of uh, uh, synthesized coherence. So a board of knowledge is growing in communication, in marketing and so forth, right? And uh, she's going to borrow ideas from other disciplines uh, to her uh, area, right? Non-coherence means that uh, you pick uh, journal articles, right? Uh, but then you discover that there are disputes, uh, debates and contradictions uh, so uh, when you are constructing knowledge in this field, you are able to state that um, research uh, in this area is inconclusive because there are debates, disputes, and, uh, and contradictions. Or probably you might even say that most of the studies that have been conducted in this area are faulty, right? And it's true, personally, I've come across journal articles that were published, even in good journals, by the way, but they are faulty. The methodology was wrong. The analysis was wrong, right? I'll tell you a disappointment that um, I encountered one time, especially when I went to one of the uh, 
good journals in the in Emirates. I think it's a journal of decision making, if I'm if I I'm not mistaken. And I saw a publication, right? And now when I looked through the methodology section, and it was about communication incidentally, right? I looked at the methodology section. I critiqued the methodology. Oh my! I looked at the, I looked at the outputs. It was terrible. It was actually a disaster, right? But it had been published by those fellows, right? I don't even know how they published it, right? But it was published, and it was terrible. So in such cases, you can actually construct knowledge in terms of having misleading studies, right? You critique and dismiss those studies as, uh, as misleading, as poorly constructed, right? Uh, with the uh, methodological flaws, meaning that they cannot actually inform the development of uh, knowledge in that particular discipline. So that's what you do. Yes, Joseph, can, you can come in. Thank you very much, Prof. I, I just wanted to to get back to Florence. I don't know if I I have a right to, to share my screen just for a minute. I don't see. I think I cannot uh, share. Let, let me unshare here, and uh, I think you should be having a, a right. Let me first unshare. Uh, where is this? Stop share. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I don't know if Florence can take interest and uh, look at my screen. I I have just asked Prof for explaining and uh, I was picking ideas from him. And I thought that if I went to my search engine and try to see how I can combine these two words together, uh, transition and communication, but I want to test them in the sector of energy. So I just go to my search engine and I have transition communication in energy. And Florence, you can notice that uh, I have here 196,687 hits. And those are the possible papers that are there in your area of study. So you could as well, uh, go ahead and do advanced search in this and uh, possibly want to have some of these appear in your, your abstract uh, for purposes of, of uh, easier reading and you can check and you can see I already have 456 papers that are talking about communication, they are talking about transition and they are talking about energy. So probably as Prof said, sometimes uh, how we look for this information is what makes us think that the information is not there. You really have to be very careful on how you decide on the Boolean words that you're going to use. So Prof, that's just what I wanted to, to, to share with the, my sister Florence. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, uh, for that. Um, another, another question? Rochelle, please go ahead. Yes, Prof. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. My question is, uh, you made a statement that not everything in, on the internet is scholarly. So I just wanted to know, how do you identify that an article is scholarly or no? Do we always have to use only uh, Google Scholar or uh, Science Direct, or there is a way of identifying that an article is scholarly? Thank you. Joseph, since you were demonstrating and I brought you here as an assistant, can you take us to Google again? You see your screen. But this time, don't use Google Scholar. Don't use Google Scholar. Simply go to Google and type the same thing that you are typing. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Now, that, that, at that point, we were, in, we were going to Science Direct. Oh, you had Let gone me... to Science Direct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can't go to just Google, Google, Google. But, uh, Rochelle, can. yeah, we try. If you can't, then it's okay. I can still. Uh, I, I mean, Rochelle, just try to go, well, go to Google, Google, Google. Not Google Scholar and type, and then you'll see every rubbish will come your way. Uh, you'll find that some of the information is not published. Now, when I say scholarly journal articles, I mean articles that have gone peer review and published in the recognized, what we call refereed journals. And for example, if you are in the area of economics, right, uh, and you are in the development economics, the first question I will ask you, uh, if I'm supervising you and you are undertaking a topic in that area, I'll ask you three questions. One, who are the most influential scholars in development economics? Right. And if you know them, then where do they publish their work? That is important. And then three, I'll ask you to give me around uh, five major journals in uh, development economics, as simple as that. So those are scholarly journal articles. They go through a peer review mechanism, right? But if you go to Google, you'll find that even some of the papers that were posted on their website, uh, some of the papers that were uh, that we are simply posted to either YouTube or somewhere will appear, right? Not all those papers are important. In fact, I think you can see some of the papers here that uh, Joseph is showing us. Uh, if we start with the first one there, right? the energy transition, how to communicate your value, right? I don't think that is from uh, a reputable journal. Even the second one here, Communication and Dissemination for Energy Transition. That's not from a, a journal. I can see smart to be project. Then the next one is from F F uh, Forbes. Then it down, Student Energy. Eh? As you move down, right. But if we, for example, Joseph put um, a dash and just uh, type there, Google Scholar, eh? after energy. Put a dash and then uh, say Google Scholar. Mm. Google Scholar, right. You see now, it will start giving you those ones which are published in the, for example, the first one there is uh, eScience Direct, and you have a meta-analysis of the behavior drivers, right? And that is really a scholarly article. Even the second one there, Right, Science Direct. The third one with the padlock is the MDPI. That is still a scholarly journal article, right? Now you find they also have your United Nations and then you move down, right? At least you are able to pick uh, journal articles or articles published in journals, right? I don't know whether I've answered your question, my friend. But the other thing that you should never forget, and I think I'll be talking about it later on, and I think Joseph will also emphasize that point, right? Whereas you can go to Google Scholars, right? Uh, don't forget to visit databases, right? You need to at least visit some databases. If you fail to get a number, at least one, you must go to one of the databases and then uh, uh, download journal articles from there. Right, uh, any other question? Any other question, ladies and gentlemen? Prof. Yes, please. This is uh, Seb Jeff. Sir? Jeff. Seb yes. Jeff. Yes, Jeff. Where do we, how, how can we access those databases? Uh, of course, if, uh, since you are doing our, you are doing a PhD in energy economics as a Makero University, degree, then you go to the librarian, right? 
Uh, I know sometimes if you have not subscribed to some of the databases, you may not be able to access uh, those databases. I think um, in this lecture, we should have brought the librarian uh, to also talk about uh, some of the journals that are available in the library, electronic journals, that kind of thing, uh, including the hard copies they have and the databases that you can actually tap into. I think it was uh, an oversight. Joseph, remind me next week we bring the librarian. Hmm? But I, I think I can also ask uh, Rochelle. Rochelle, can you talk to the librarian? The good thing with the librarian that is that she's, she's also doing her PhD. So she would be interested in sharing ideas with you. Rochelle, will you do that? Rochelle and Joseph, you will help me and also remind me so that we talk to the librarian, uh, Florence. Okay. Okay, and, and and she will, okay. I think she will, she will come in. Right. Right. Let's go to a typology of reviews. And uh, as you can see, these are types of reviews, literature reviews. And you need to know. You need to know them. Because when your colleagues will start talking about literature review. You will think that, um, in fact, many people think they understand the literature review, right? Because they have looked at uh, some, uh, they have looked at a section uh, within a journal article called literature review, right? But we forget that these are the types of reviews we have. We've got what we call an argumentative review. We've got an integrative review. We've got a historical review. We've got a methodological review. We've got a theoretical review. We've got meta-analysis. We've got scoping review. We've got state-of-the-art review. We've got umbrella review and systematic review. In fact, you can add the word literature before, before review. Eh? Systematic literature review, umbrella literature review, state-of-the-art literature review, scoping literature review, meta-analytic review, literature review, theoretical literature review, that kind of thing, right? I'm sure you now understand what I'm talking about, right? So we've got those um, uh, reviews, right? Uh, I Maybe I could just talk about one or two, and then I go to the one that we are really interested in, right, which is a systematic literature review. Sometimes, um uh, uh, systematic literature reviews uh, can actually be combined with the meta-analytic reviews, but they can also be separate. They don't mean actually the same thing, right? Under the uh, meta-analytic reviews, uh, statistics or outputs are picked from the journal articles. And those statistics are entered in a, a software, right, in order to get the effect sizes of those beta coefficients and correlations, right? And of course, the predictions uh, for us to know whether the effect size is big or small or medium, right? In other words, uh, once you do it, you are able to tell uh, what most of the studies that have been conducted over the years have managed to produce. Right, but um, if you look at um, the, the these types of uh, literature review, these types that you see, it's important for us to know that uh, uh, this area of review, right, um, of course, which is undertaken by a researcher to gain an understanding of what is happening can be done in three layers, three major layers. And of course, the first layer is uh, where we look at uh, primary studies, right, that uh, researchers conduct and publish, right? 
Uh, and that is one layer. And you can actually download all those journal articles published, right? Of course, with the data in it, primary studies. Now, of course, the second layer are the reviews of those studies, right? Like the ones we are talking about here, right? Uh, where we have uh, historical reviews, methodological reviews, scoping reviews, systematic reviews, etc. That is the second layer, right? Where you pick all the journal articles that have been published, right? And uh, you try to make sense of what is happening. And the third layer is what we call the perceptions, right? And the conclusions and the opinions, right? And the interpretations that are actually shared by researchers. And those interpretations and conclusions and perceptions shared by researchers actually become part of the knowledge of the field, right? Or what you call wisdom in that particular field, like in the case of uh, uh, energy transition, right? Uh, so you pick perceptions and conclusions and opinions and even the interpretations of what has been provided, right? Uh, and then that becomes knowledge. And in most cases, when we look at um, uh, uh, a review of literature, it is often this third layer of knowledge which is cited as a true, right? Even though uh, it often has only a loose relationship to the primary studies and the second and, 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 and the secondary literature reviews. So um, yes, those three layers are very important: the primary, right, and then of the the, 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 the reviews, but also the perceptions and the conclusions. So those are the three types that um, uh, are evident in the in the in, in the literature review, right? Now, when we talk about, for example, argumentative literature review, I'm going to just give you a general understanding of these uh, things, and then we we'll go to systematic literature review, right? If you look at the argumentative review or literature review, right? Of course, what happens here, scholars attempt to examine literature selectively, right, in order to support or refute an argument. So what happens here, if, for example, Joseph Elasso wants to build an argument, right, to demonstrate that, you know, when people uh, earn more income, right, or more money, or the salary goes up, the fellows will abandon, right, the traditional fuels and will move to uh, transition fuels. And when their incomes actually go up, right, and they move from one uh, indifference curve to another uh, indifference curve, then these fellows will actually move from the transition of fuels to uh, probably modern fuels. So what Joseph will do is to look for literature that will help him to support or refute an argument, right? And of course, uh, he will uh, center his argument either around the energy ladder right, a kind of theory or a perception or a model, right, or probably somewhere else. And that is all, you will not look at anything else. So the purpose here is to develop a body of literature that establish a certain viewpoint, but can also establish a contrarian viewpoint, something that is contrary, right? So, uh, he might actually do that, and that is what we call argumentative literature review. I will not really go into uh, details, but that's what it is. And in most cases, people do that. They simply go to journal articles, right? They forget all about the other 
uh, studies and only pick those ones that are, uh, uh, and they simply review and advance their arguments, right? Now, of course, the second type is what you call an integrative review, right? And uh, of course, this review here is a kind of study or some form of research that will be uh, centered on literature. But here, the objective will be to review, right, and critique and come up with a, a synthesis that seems to represent literature in that area. So in other words, it has some bit of balanced perspective, right? It's, it's, it's a bit balanced. So the fellow will look for critiques, right? The fellow will also get literature that supports and also come up with a synthesis, right? In other words, he will be talking about a topic in an integrated way, right? Such that the framework that he develops, either new or probably uh, a modified uh, framework, right? Uh, 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 is, is representative, right, of the literature that exists in that area, right? And uh, it will be talking about a particular, a particular topic, right? And that's what we call an integrative uh, literature review. Right, maybe uh, in the interest of time, let me skip, 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 skip all the rest, but since I'm talking to people who are doing energy economics, I have seen a bias, right? Uh, especially for those who come from economics, they usually talk about methodology, right? And they tend to pick some sections of the methodology to build an argument that tends to highlight a new area or a contribution to knowledge. So, in this case, it will be quite useful for us to discuss what we call methodological review, right? And uh, of course, uh, I know that uh, many times when we review literature, we tend to look at the findings section, right? But this methodological review is a little bit different. It will not focus on what someone said, right, in form of findings but it will talk about how they came about saying what they said. In other words, the method of analysis. So here your, your work, right, um, or your paper uh, will review methods of analysis, right? And uh, these methods or these methods will provide a framework uh, for understanding right, that particular study at different levels, right? It can be at the level of a theory, uh, it can be at the level of the research approaches, it can be at the level of data collection and probably analysis techniques. So here you tend to review, or you will tend to review methods of analysis, right? And of course also interrogate how the researchers draw upon a wide variety of knowledge, right? Ranging from the conceptual level, right? To practical documents for use in the field, right? Uh, especially in as far as philosophical perspectives are concerned. I hope you still remember the ontological and epistemological considerations the quantitative and qualitative integration, uh, issues of sampling, issues of interviewing, issues of data collection and data analysis. So you can actually interrogate uh, those methods and therefore you can have a paper, right, that you can call methodological literature review and you can publish that paper because there are journal articles that actually take that kind of thing. And if you want your contribution to focus on that aspect, right, then you can do so. And uh, your paper can actually be published 
in um, what we call econometric right uh, journals and uh, if you are dealing with the constructs that are psychometric in nature you can also publish your paper in psychometric journals right so uh, that is also an area that uh, exists now the other thing that you probably have to know is uh, the methodology so is, is the theoretical review theoretical review right let me say something briefly before i go to systematic literature review now with the a theoretical literature review right uh, i know that uh, most economists don't like this uh, aspect of theory i remember there's a student who made a comment and said this man here uh, this entire is always talking about a theory, 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 right? Uh, and, uh, and and we don't like him because he talks about theory most of the time, right? Uh, so I, I, I overheard that statement from the students. But let me tell you something, right? If you are going to do a theoretical review, the purpose of this theoretical review is to examine, right, the body of theory that has accumulated in regard to a particular concept or a particular theory or a particular issue or a particular phenomenon. That's why when Joseph talks about energy transitions, right? Maybe Joseph, you can tell us the, the two major theories that um, you have discovered under energy transitions. Over to you, Joseph. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. <clears throat> um, of course, energy transition is uh, a wide concept and uh, you you study it at different levels. Uh, you might come across theories that explain a transition at farm level, level uh, transition, probably a global transition. Like if you look at what Irena is talking about, is talking about a global transition. So possibly at that rate, you'll be able to deal with a transition theory. There's one a possible theory that is borrowed from the clinical medicine, especially when they're studying the transition in the nursing students. But when we talk about household energy transition that I'm looking at, out of the about uh, 392 articles that we read, we do find that basically most of them are talking about energy ladders theory and energy stacking theory. Those are the major two. But of course, there are some other models that we've come across like um, a multi-level perspective framework. Uh, there's also another recent uh, model that's called the energy culture uh, framework. But just to answer Prof's question, the common two theories that are, are used by scholars in the area of household energy transition the energy ladder theory and the energy stacking theory. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lasso. I didn't want to take you very, uh, or maybe beyond, uh, but you can briefly talk about the, uh, the, the energy ladder and the stacking and how this explains transition. It's quite important because as we talk about theoretical reviews, right, they will be required to really get these theories and read about them so that they know how these theories actually inform their studies so that they actually appreciate uh, what we are talking mm -hmm. about. Otherwise, they will never see the use of having theory in the introduction section of their work and how they can possibly mm -hmm. integrate uh, or probably even dismiss some of the approaches or models and come up with their own arguments. Can you briefly talk mm. about, uh, without necessarily talking about your gap, I know where your gap is centered, but um, talk about those two theories mm. only, yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, you will notice that uh, uh, the energy ladder theory, for example, basically the, a lot of work about this theory was done by Leach uh, in 1992, but of course there was earlier work uh, about energy ladder theory that dates back as early as 1980. But what is very central about, about the energy ladder theory, which of course some scholars refer to it as energy ladder hypothesis, is that the central argument here is that as the socioeconomic status of the household, and of course when we talk about the socioeconomic status, we are 
referring to the income. Is the income of the household improves, uh, households tend to drop um, unclean fuels. In fact, unclean fuels that they use in this case refer to traditional fuels, which in most households in our setting here is biomass, charcoal and uh, animal waste, charcoal, cow dung, uh, firewood. So the, the argument here, the theoretical argument here is that once the household income improves and moves higher, and then the households also will drop uh, unclean fuels or biomass and move to start using cleaner fuels. But in this case, uh, the theory argues that this, this, this um, fuels are classified into three different levels, such that we have those ones which are really very unclean, and that would be uh, charcoal, that would be firewood, that would be cow dung and animal wastes. But as soon as the income begins to climb, then the household will also climb a little bit to what we call the transition of fuels. And that's where you find now a household beginning to try to use uh, other improved methods, I mean, other improved fuels, including briquettes, including kerosene, uh, that, that are a little bit cleaner. But then as the household income even grows and, 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 and comes much better for households, they will abandon uh, the, the, all these other forms of fuel, and then they will move to uh, probably what we call now as modern fuels. That's now electricity and LOPG and sometimes biogas for, for those countries that have taken advantage to extract this biogas. In short, the central argument here is about income. The theory, the assumption here is that once uh, the household income improves, then the households must be able to move to use cleaner fuels. Now, <clears throat> so the basis of using this theory, in fact, in your study, is that you possibly would be able to tell the world that, yes, the households, once we enable them, probably empower them to have, have much income, then we would be able to tell them to move away from uh, unclean fuels, and indeed people will be possibly able to listen to you because you have empowered them and their income is, is, is better and they're able to afford. Remember, fuel has a price attached to it. And so that price determines whether somebody will actually go for the higher or to the lower vis-a-vis -vis the income that somebody has. So that is ideally the argument there. But then also argument number two is that these fuels also according to the theory are grouped according to the order of preference. And this preference also does not only look at the price, but also looks at issues like the cleanliness of the fuel, the time taken to use it. And then the other aspect is how convenient is it to use this type of fuel? So you find those key constructs are the things that you derive from the, uh, the, the, the energy ladder theory. That is the argument. But you see, as you, 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 you continue reading, you come across this other alternative hypothesis and uh, what we call the energy stacking ladder or energy stacking uh, uh, hypothesis. This, this one, uh, for them, they say that, no, 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 no. Fuels do not, uh, in fact, in economics, they say fuels are not perfect substitutes. So in that case, this energy stacking hypothesis or theory I use that even when my income in, in improves, there are some types of functions or uses of fuel, especially firewood. Those same functions cannot be performed when I use electricity. And so those, uh, the energy ladder scholars argue that, sorry, the energy stacking ladder argue that, no, these fuels can be used together. I can have electricity, and in the case when my income is low, I use uh, charcoal. When my income is much better today, then I use uh, biomass. So in, in short, the energy stacking approach is such that fuels are used together. We, you don't have to abandon this and then move to, to the other one, but depending on the function and probably how satisfied you are, 
with the utility that you derive from that particular fuel. So the argument here is that households do not necessarily move away from one particular fuel when their income increases, but instead they move to this, but also keeping the, the, the previous type of fuel so that once in a while they are able to use all of them. Uh, Prof, maybe in short, that's the little I can share about the two uh, theories uh, that are commonly used in the, in, the, in the study of household energy consumption. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, certainly, you know, I will require a section, uh, a theoretical review section. Um, and um, uh, I'm also telling uh, the rest of the students who have yet started uh, on this journey of uh, undertaking research that uh, since you have theory in your introduction and you have also theory in your methodology and uh, in your literature review, you should have also a section uh, that you call theoretical review before you go to the empirical review of literature. This is a section where you are supposed to examine uh, the body of theory that has accumulated in regard to your construct that you are studying. Like in the case of Elasu, it is energy transitions. Then this section of the theoretical literature review will actually help you to establish what theories already exist. Like uh, Joseph has been articulating those theories. What he hasn't given us is the relationship between them right? He should be able to give us the relationship between those theories and uh, to what degree, right, uh, those theories, or what you call the existing theories, have been investigated because we don't know uh, how far, right, these theories have been investigated uh, so that we are able to develop new hypotheses uh, to be tested. And uh, of course, if this is done very well, right, it will help a researcher in this case to establish uh, a lack of appropriate theories, right? Or probably uh, it will help uh, him to reveal current theories which have been used uh, but are inadequate uh, for explaining new or emerging research problems. And I think that's what we are doing with Joseph, right? That those theories exist, yes, but they take certain things for granted. And I think he has even given you one of the things, right, of uh, uh, substituting one fuel for another, right? The assumption is that the fellow, as incomes go up, the fellow will move from uh, this level here, uh, from traditional fuels to transitions and so forth. Right, but um, uh, there's that concept of uh, perfect substitution, right, which may not be made. And of course, there are also other sentiments. Uh, and of course, um, uh, identities that uh, uh, individuals or probably certain things that individuals attach uh, to certain fuels, so they cannot actually uh, simply transit uh, because the incomes have gone up. In fact, some of them will even want to go back to traditional uh, fuels as income uh, go up, right? So these are very important reviews and the unit of analysis in this case will focus on what we call a theoretical concept uh, or construct, uh, which is energy transitions or probably a whole theory or a whole framework uh, in this case. So. I think uh, I just wanted to give you an overview of that, but uh, I have uh, more or less uh, mentioned those things that you will need, right? Now, in the interest of time, um, let me briefly introduce systematic literature review, right? And then uh, thereafter, uh, I think we shall close and then uh, we probably uh, meet uh, another day to add to the body of knowledge that would have established uh, today. So systematic literature review, right, as you can see, uh, is also referred to as structured literature review. That's why you have that word is systematic, right? Systematic 
literature review. So in other words, this form of literature review consists of an overview of existing evidence pertinent to a clearly formulated research question. So as Joseph will be telling you, and I think Joseph uh, in our other, well, next lecture, you can use some of the papers we have published, we have co-published, right? Uh, for them to see the kind of questions that we had to formulate at the beginning. And in fact, in some universities, right, uh, PhDs may be awarded to a student who does a very nice systematic literature review. So you can actually write a dissertation uh, using uh, this approach. In other words, the journal articles that exist become data that you review and you write down your ideas, your thoughts, right? And um, you'll be given a PhD, right? In our case here, I usually tell students to start with the literature, sorry, with a systematic literature review, right? And publish a paper out of that. After all, before you graduate, you are required to have published around two papers. So that will be paper number one. But the same paper, right? I ask the students to turn it around and uh, uh, write a proposal out of it, right? And uh, writing a proposal will be very easy because you'll be having your research gaps there already. It's a matter of um, um, uh, panel beating a few sections and adding a few things and also removing some of the things. And then you'll have a proposal ready in just about three days. If you do a good do systematic literature review, which will take you about a month or probably three weeks, after that, and you send the thing for publication, right, the, the remaining time, about two days or three days or four days or a week, you would have written a proposal that will submit to GRC and you will have no problem of having your proposal approved, right, because it will be based on sound knowledge or evidence available in the literature. So that is how important a uh, systematic literature review is. Now, for the other students uh, who are not doing energy economics, I always encourage them. I haven't encouraged anybody from energy economics, but I will also start encouraging them. After they had, the after, pro after producing a proposal, I want to start encouraging you to write a theory building paper, right, uh, out of, uh, uh, that uh, proposal, You're right? First of all, you have a systematic literature review, which you send out for publication. Two, you have a proposal which you present to Bogorovi, which will be passed then after thereafter. We again transform the proposal into a theory building paper that you will publish again, right? As a theory building paper. Then after going to the field, then we, we write another theory testing uh, paper, which will again be published, right? at that stage. So public, publishing then becomes very easy, not only that, but you'll be generating new knowledge in the discipline, but from different angles and different perspectives. So as you can see, uh, this is um, a systematic literature review. It, it, it actually uses uh, what we call pre-specified and standardized methods, right, in order to identify and uh, clearly or and critically appraise relevant literature. So as Joseph will be highlighting, um, I, I'm, I'm very happy that he really started by uh, demonstrating to our friend Florence who had difficulties and said, no, it really depends on the, on the words that you select, the words that you choose, right? So you may actually not even get anything on the internet and and I and, and this happens by the way, you should not be shocked about it. I remember there's a time I was looking for uh, certain journal articles, right? And I went to the internet and um, searched and I didn't get any journal article for about a week. Then the following week, right, I modified my uh, my words, right, search words, and I got a number of them. Right, many, many, many journal articles uh, 
uh, were downloaded and read, right? So when we talk about systematic literature review, the mere fact that you are using the word systematic, right? So you will have a pre-specified and standardized method uh, for identifying those journal articles and also for critically appraising those journal articles. And then you use those pre-specified methods, right, to collect, right, uh, to report and analyze data. So you collect data from the journal articles, right? You report, right, the data that you have collected from the journal articles. And you also analyze data uh, from those studies. And uh, we'll be taking you through uh, some of the uh, some of the methods that uh, exist, right? And of course, the major ob objective here, right, is to deliberately document, right, what is available. Is deliberately uh, critique, right, or critically evaluate, and uh, of course summarize and uh, scientific. Uh, findings, right? That you, you, you that, that are scattered in those uh, uh, journal articles. Now, I'll tell you one of the uh, 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 one of the values of uh, uh, systematic literature review, right? Is what you see there under bullet number two, right? Supporting better decisions for policymakers, managers, entrepreneurs, etc. etc. I'll tell you during COVID period, for example, right, as people were talking about vaccines, a number of journal articles were published on the internet, right? And, um, uh, uh, and um, at some stage, People wanted to know, right, how far knowledge has actually developed in that area of vaccines. So they started writing systematic literature review papers about vaccines. And those systematic review papers actually were used by policymakers, right, to show how effective some of the drugs were and how ineffective some of the drugs uh, where in, in trying to combat that uh, deadly virus uh, uh, that is called COVID-19, right? So that's what it is. And I remember reviewing two papers, actually. Um, one is, uh, it was a systematic literature review, right? Uh, which was actually uh, sent to the Journal of Public Health. Uh, and the second one was not actually a publication as such, but it was a, a paper that was written by the uh, Science Council, right? And um, uh, it, it was actually talking about uh, combating uh, future related viral infections. But this gentleman, our researcher, had actually picked um, uh, data uh, from... Uh, right from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up to where we are today, COVID-19, but it was dealing with viruses, right? And uh, it was a very interesting paper, by the way, but it was uh, meant for policy uh, makers. Uh, eventually it was presented to the policy makers uh, and it was approved, right? And of course, it of course it had very nice content and the fellow did a, a, a good job. The only thing that was missing was actually the methodology for the systematic literature review that uh, I requested the authors to, to document, which they did. And later on, uh, again, uh, it was published, right? So uh, high quality systematic literature reviews are very important because they support uh, decision-making uh, in those areas, right? Now, of course, the other one is for you, academicians, right, and researchers. Uh, high quality reviews will help you to synthesize the literature under review, right? And of course, as you can see, this method has become really very, very popular and it has actually replaced the uh, traditional reviews, right? Um, in almost every discipline, right? So for you, if you are still using traditional reviews, right, I think you need to move very fast and uh, uh, get into this area as well. I think I feel a bit tired. Let me pause a little bit here. 
and uh, since I don't have a glass of water to take, um, we you, I, let me give you an opportunity to ask if you have a question, right? Uh, by the way, although I say that I'm introducing systematic literature review, I've just given you a very small portion of the introduction uh, and you will possibly uh, start from there. But you can ask questions. We can use this time uh, to handle questions. And since we have agreed to meet on Monday, um, uh, Joseph, I hope you... I don't know whether they... By the way, let me first find out, is is it okay that we meet on Monday or that was uh, Rochelle's uh, idea? Is it okay? It's okay, Prof. Okay, great. From me, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, comments and questions so that we actually stop here. I feel tired. We started at 5.30, 5.40. Now this is uh, 7.40, about two hours. Flavia Nachirija, you are very quiet. I want to hear from you. Flavia Nachirija. Yes, Professor. Yes, can you talk to me, please? Good evening. Good evening, how are you? My query or my, my, what I want to know is why is knowledge from years back, for example, you mentioned in 1997, why is it put aside or why is it not considered in subsequent years, maybe 10 years later, why is it disregarded always? I always find it unfair. And to me, I feel like it is said that we do not regard literature that is older than five years. I don't know why it is always like that. That is my query. And it has been for a long time. Uh -huh. Now you see, Flavia, if I had not prompted you to ask, you wouldn't have asked that question. Why do you always keep quiet? Hmm? It's quite important that you ask those questions. And um, it doesn't matter even when you feel that the question I'm going to ask is a foolish question. Please ask. Right. Uh, there are no questions that can be regarded as foolish. They are all useful questions. Right, but let me attempt to answer the question, right? One of the things that I, I want you to learn, not you, Nachidija, as an individual, but each one of us attending this lecture, right, is always to have our own thinking and perspective about knowledge. You'll be surprised. Uh, most of the things that we regard as knowledge may actually be knowledge in one environment. And in another environment, it will not be knowledge at all. Right? You know, the other day, I, I don't know whether it was the same uh, group or I was talking to another uh, group of people. And I did tell them this, that uh, if you were brought up in a stable family, right? And your mother was a very good mother and your daddy was a good daddy. I'm sure wherever you go and the examples you will give will relate to your family, your father and your mother. Even when you are thinking of getting married or marrying, your mother, your father will become a role model, right? Because you were brought up in a very nice family. Now for you, you will think that is always like that because that is the reality of a home that you are brought in. Now there is another man somewhere who was brought up in a family where a mother was hopeless, right? And maybe you discover that the mother produced about 20 children, but each child has a father, right? It is possible. 
Now that man or that woman who was brought up in such a family will have a different story. Now you have another one who was brought up and a family where the father was hopeless. Right, that one also has a different story altogether. Now when these three come together and they start discussing, I can assure you some of them will get a shock of their lives because they only have a partial explanation of their behaviors. And this is exactly what happens in research. So what am I saying? You will discover that we still refer to Socrates and Aristotle. Sometimes the knowledge we are using uh, dates back to 370 BC or AD, and we still use it, right? Because that is relevant knowledge. So you cannot actually say that, why is it that we disregard knowledge? No. That's why I'm saying you should have a mind that is able to discern certain statements. Sometimes we make these statements out of excitement. And for you who is in a class, you actually cram it and take it that way, and you think that that's what it is. Right, and that's why you must always critique and have that, that critical mind. So some of the theories we are using, uh, you know I talked about theoretical reviews. Some of the theories were actually developed around 1830s, others 1970s. If you're looking at Bandura social learning theory, 1970 something, right? Uh, if you look at the theory of Amatya Sain, some time back, right? Eh? The capability theory by Amatya Sain. If you look at these other models of the Ricardos and the rest of them, you are still using them, right? If you look at uh, the demand Caesar diagrams, these were developed a long, long time ago when they were still building the discipline, actually developing the, the economic discipline, right? Right, but today you probably no longer, you, have, you even take some of those things for granted. Look at the Keynesian theories, right, of interest rates, right? You are still using that knowledge, right? Now, when we say that use the most recent, right, and listen attentively to this, we are not saying disregard, no. We are simply saying this. Knowledge grows incrementally. So somebody who carried out a study in 1970 must have reviewed the literature of 1940s and 50s and he was able to advance an argument. So you shouldn't go back to 1940s and 1920s unless your argument takes you back to 1940s. If the one that was published in 1960 is irrelevant and does not address your issue, then you go back to 1940s, right? But even in 1940s, if you go back to 1940s, discuss the development of the concept, right? And then tell us, why that, de that debate was discontinued by scholars. If most of the studies, right, were published around 1970s, and from 1970 to 2020, we do not see journal articles being published about the same issue. That means that you are resurrecting a dead debate. Now, if you are going to resurrect a dead debate, then you must first of all give us the history, right, of how that theory, that concept developed, the debates and disputes, right, that existed up to 1970s, and why scholars actually disregarded and discontinued the, the debate and started looking at other things. And then you give us reasons why it is important today to resurrect a debate of 1970s. That's what we are saying. It really depends, and that's why we are talking about review of literature. You know, when you pick one journal article, two journal articles, we shall tell you, yes, look at the, the ones published in the last three years, and you read about five journal articles, and you feel you are satisfied. Joseph will tell you that when we go to the internet, right, and we are doing a systematic literature review, you might even get one million hits. In other words, you have one million journal articles. It is similar to somebody going to the field and collecting data from one million respondents. If you have 40 million Ugandans, you pick data from one million respondents. 
because these represent data points. So if Joseph tells you you get 1 million, or you, or you narrow down, right, using, of course, you have the inclusion and exclusion criteria, right? Then if you narrow down to around 400 journal articles, you must read them and summarize. And you may find that the journal articles span between 19, let's say, uh, from 1980s or 1990s to 2023. So you are, you, are, you, you are reviewing journal articles published in the last 20 years. So of course, if you are going to use traditional literature reviews, right, traditional review methods, you'll be told download journal articles published in the last three years. And that's not what I'm talking about. If I talked about theoretical reviews and I told Joseph to begin talking about the energy uh, ladder uh, theory, then you know when the theory was actually developed. It wasn't yesterday. No, it has been around for very, uh, some good time. So that's what we are saying, that even the journal articles that you pick, right, if they are relevant, right, and they are recent, they have a debate, fine. But since it's systematic literature review, you must pick a number of them over an extended period. Now, the ones you are talking about relate to what we call traditional reviews. And I'm not really teaching about traditional literature reviews. But when I, I come back here and I talk about it, then you can ask me about those things. And I'll tell you that these days I tend to value theoretical reviews, meta-analytic reviews, and systematic literature reviews. Have I answered your question, Flavia? I don't know whether it's Fla yeah, Flavia. Have I answered or I've confused you? Flavia, before I go to Rochelle, Flavia, Natirija, Unmute and speak, please. Professor, Professor, I have answered the question. The computer was having issues. Uh -huh. I have the question. Thank you very much. Or maybe you were having issues. OK. <laughs> no, the computer. OK. Yes, Rochelle. Mm. Uh, Prof, I just wanted more clarity on the layers of uh, literature review, specifically the difference between the second and the third stage. The second and the third stage, right? Yes. Right, right. Now, I talked about layers of literature review, right? And those layers are very important. We have got the first layer, we've got the second layer, and we've got the third layers. And those are, again, those layers represent what we call uh, literature reviews. So as we talk about the typology of reviews, we also talk about layers, right? Now we are saying that um, when we start thinking about knowledge in a given field, that knowledge consists of three layers. It is knowledge. And knowledge is contained in published work. The first layer, right, represents primary studies that researchers conduct and publish. Like now, if you go to the internet, look for journal articles published by um, Arakit in Energy and Economics and he said, no, no, they are there. That's the first layer. And most, and most of their studies actually are, are empirical, right? So they are what you call primary studies, right? Based on secondary data, right, and published. Is that clear? The second one, right, the second type or layer are the reviews of those studies that summarize and offer new interpretations. Those new interpretations are built from and often extend beyond the primary studies. In other words, what you do here, you go to the internet and pick all those journal articles published by Senonos and Vincent, 
sorry, and, and who and a kit, including that gentleman Elasso, who has also published a number of papers. You pick all those studies, but with the view of summarizing right their findings and offering new interpretations right to the already existing body of knowledge of course Eras will have an objective of extending knowledge beyond the primary studies conducted by Ar arakit and uh, his colleague and that's why you'll find some studies which are actually systematic literature review papers and meta-analytic review papers, right? Or even theoretical papers, right? The ones that will review theories. So those are the, they fall under the second category of uh, knowledge. The first one are the primary ones. The second one fall in this category, right? Where you have meta-analytic reviews and now the third one, right, usually fall under the category of, I think if I take you back to, uh, to this one here, that slide. Do you see that third last, what you call the state of the art review? Do you see that? Hello? Yes, oh yes, state of the art review. So they fall under that category where you have uh, conclusions and opinions and uh, interpretations that are somehow shared by scholars in a particular area, right? Uh, those are more or less called state of the art. So in other words, the fellow will give you a summary in the, and the introduction is usually very short, by the way, right? Uh, and when the fellow is discussing, right, is discussing the perceptions, is discussing the views and the opinions and the conclusions of scholars and the fellow gives you directions for future research. So that's what they do. And incidentally, most of the knowledge that is generated in a particular discipline centers around that third category, right? Where if somebody has done, a, for example, a primary study, another fellow like uh, Elasso now does a meta-analytic review, Right, of course, based on all those things. Now, somebody will pick Elasso's paper, right, and then form opinions and perceptions and uh, come up with the interpretations of a number of them, and he writes a paper, right. Uh, some of them could be scoping reviews, uh, while others are state-of-the-art reviews. The fellow will tell you how far uh, research has, has, has advanced in that area, uh, and what we should be looking at maybe in the next uh, five years or 10 years. And it will influence uh, uh, thinking um, or perceptions of scholars, right, in that particular area. And they will all jump on the, uh, on the bandwagon and start believing in those aspects. That, does that make sense, Rochelle? Yes, Prof, thank you so Great. much. Great. Any other question, ladies and gentlemen? Right. Since we don't seem to have uh, more questions, I'll ask Elasu to wrap up uh, what we've been saying uh, using a few words and uh, and uh, and wish us um, uh, a good night. Elasu, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for. Uh... Uh, I have been writing, incidentally, I found myself uh, retaking the course. So, so the things you've been, you know, talking about, I found myself uh, writing a lot of notes here. And uh, so that really uh, brings the real fact that learning never stops. We... We have been told a number of things, uh, my colleagues, um, and uh, we, we must count ourselves lucky that we have opportunity to, to be guided by one of the best. Uh, Some time back when I was thinking of uh, the supervisors, one of the things I decided to do 
was to go and check on their profiles and were shocked. By that time, uh, professor here had about 176, I think, publications. And I was asking myself, how is this possible? But now from what he's saying, when he begins to speak, then you really see how that was possible. And it still goes on and on and on. We do not know uh, when is he planning to stop, but I think by the time he stops, my time might reach 500 publications plus. So for me, <clears throat> as uh, one of his students, uh, I draw a lot of things, uh, a lot of pictures when he's speaking. And I just want to, to just mention a few things. One is that there seems to be a very big distinction between a systematic literature review and other reviews. And if you listen from what Prof has said, the fact that you're going to have to read about 300 papers makes the entire process very rigorous. And because the entire process is very rigorous, by the time you're done, you have an understanding of the phenomena that you're trying to, re, uh, to, to study. And that is very important. I have always told my colleagues and uh, whom I am in the same cohort with, that if you find yourself unable to sustain a discussion in that area of your study, if you cannot sustain a discussion, even for five minutes, then you know you have not yet read. And the only thing that can force you to read, the only process that can force you to read is a systematic literature review. I have done it. I have always gone to prof's office uh, with my work, having spent sleepless nights on the review. Then you go there and then says, no, this you have not conceptualized. You have you have not yet reached there. And so uh, in the end, when you are able to publish that paper, you will be very grateful. And you see yourself uh, uh, knowing more than what uh, others could have, those who have done other types of review. So I want to encourage you and uh, uh, ask you to go ahead and try this uh, systematic review. Uh, lastly, <clears throat> um, I also want to, to, to echo what Professor said. Um, there is no way you can just start reading without identifying the area of your interest. You can't just read things in you, you need to know your area before you set up all this entire process. It's only that when you're able to know where you're going. So I just have almost uh, nothing too much to discuss this evening, but I just want to thank you for attending uh, this uh, lecture and also thank very much Prof for availing time and giving all of us this information. I can assure you for us who used to have these lectures at 5 a.m., I would organize sometimes at 4 a.m. and prof would wake up and teach us uh, from 4 or 5 a.m. up to 7. And indeed, people benefited a lot and uh, some have their papers already published. And that is a plus for you. So you now be looking for one more paper for you to be able to graduate because they need it too. So thank you very much, prof. And thank you very much, colleagues, for attending uh, this lecture today. Uh, we hope to meet you again uh, on Monday. What I do not know what time, whether it's the same time. Uh, uh, Rochelle, you may confirm. Yes, same time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to really wish you a very nice evening. Uh, thank you very much. Go and enjoy the remaining part of the day. And God bless you. God bless you and bye. Bye. Thank you, Joseph. Welcome.